It's truly such a rare and special thing when two people find each other and find that immediate connection that leads to a long-lasting, beautiful relationship. When two people can love each other and stick together despite their partner's past or the baggage they carry, it's truly inspiring. But sometimes, despite all the love between the pair, despite the fight they put up to stay together, a person's past can sneak up and destroy everything. And that is what happened in today's case. It's truly a heartbreaking story of two people who fell in love just for someone else to come in and take it all away. But before we get into the case, I want to talk about one way we can all help keep ourselves safe from scammers, spammers, and data brokers, and anyone else who may want to target you and hurt you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your family members, all that information is out there on the internet for anyone to see. And that is why I started using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura helps keep me and my information safe by showing me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. I know that one of the biggest reasons why I get so many spam texts and calls is because big companies aren't keeping our data safe. Recently, AT&T revealed that nearly all of their customers' call and text records have been exposed in a massive data breach. Then, just months ago, they admitted that over 70 million of their users' social security numbers ended up on the dark web. Even if you don't have AT&T, if you texted someone with that carrier, which chances are you have, then your number could have been exposed. So knowing that your data can be exposed at the drop of a dime, you need more ways to protect your data, and that is where Aura comes in. Once I set up my account with Aura, they found 16 different sites that were selling my information and started working immediately to protect my privacy. This means removing my phone number and addresses from unwanted sites, leading to reduced spam calls, spam mail, and peace of mind, knowing that my data is being protected. But Aura does so much more to protect me from online threats that I can't see. With Aura, I get other features like antivirus, VPN, parental controls, transaction monitoring, and identity theft insurance. They also have an AI-powered call assistant that will pick up any unknown calls on my behalf and scream them for spam or scams. Then the AI will forward the legit calls to me so I don't miss the important calls for appointments, deliveries, or emergencies. Aura is really easy to set up, it's super user-friendly, and the best part is that you get all of this at one affordable price. Aura is always on doing the hard work to keep me safe so I can focus on other tasks, not worrying about my accounts being hacked and losing everything I worked so hard for. To me, that is priceless. I value my privacy and I value yours. To keep yourself and your information safe, head to aura.com slash Rachel Shannon to start your 14-day free trial today. Once again, click the link in the description box below and head to aura.com slash Rachel Shannon for your 14-day free trial today. Thank you again so much to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic, heartbreaking murder of Patrick De La Cerda. Patrick De La Cerda was born on June 4th, 1992 to parents Patricia Rons and Max De La Cerda. Max, Patrick's father, is originally from Spain and his mother, Patricia, is originally from France, but Patrick grew up with his brother, Bryce, and his half-brother, Justin, in Deltona, Florida. Patrick was described by those who knew him as a beautiful soul who was full of life and happiness. He was kind, caring, charismatic, and outgoing, and he was known to be the life of the party. He lived every day to its fullest and just had this larger-than-life personality. His presence brought joy and light to everyone around him. His parents said that he was really great with kids and babies. He loved being around them and someday had hopes of becoming a father. For the time being, 25-year-old Patrick was working a construction job with his father in Deltona. By June of 2017, Patrick was on a dating app called Plenty of Fish when he met Jessica Devnani, who lived 30 miles away in Orlando and worked as a bank teller at the time. According to Jessica, when they met, she and Patrick just hit it off right away. The two got along so well. They found a very special connection from the jump, and before long, they fell in love. The two loved partying together, traveling, and exploring wherever and whenever they could. 
Over the course of several months, their relationship blossomed and everyone around them could see just how in love they were. According to Patrick's mother, in late 2017, Patrick came home one day and exclaimed to his mom that Jessica was the one. He was confident that she was his soulmate and wanted to be with her forever. Patricia knew that these two lovebirds just had something so special between the two of them. So by December of 2017, Patrick popped the question. He asked Jessica to marry him, giving her a temporary ring with plans of giving her the real ring at a later time. He had actually ordered a custom engagement ring and ordered it to be delivered to his home. He was very romantic, and when he pictured his life with Jessica, he wanted it to be perfect. So that started with getting her the perfect ring. After this engagement, Jessica and Patrick continued their whirlwind romance, excitingly planning their wedding and looking forward to their future together. However, everything would change by February 27th, 2018, when the future that the two were dreaming of was suddenly and violently ripped away from them. By that morning of the 27th, Patrick's dad, Max, received a call from someone stating that they had a package for Patrick that needed to be delivered. Patrick lived on a property owned by Max's then-girlfriend, so Max gave the man directions to get the package delivered and hung up the call. After that, he contacted Patrick to let him know about this, but Patrick didn't answer. Max then texted him about it, but still, Patrick was not answering. Meanwhile, Jessica was also starting to become concerned for Patrick's well-being. She too had been calling and texting him that morning, but was getting no response. This was very out of character for Patrick, who would always text Jessica every morning to check in and see how her day was starting. After being unable to reach Patrick and hearing that Jessica also wasn't able to get a hold of him, Max asked that his then-girlfriend, Shannon, go to check on Patrick at his home because at that time, Max was actually 70 miles away on a construction job, so Shannon was more readily available. Now, Patrick lived in a wooded area that is only accessible via access roads that you take through a gate, which then brings you to a road that leads to the home. When Shannon first got there by around 11.30 a.m., she did see that there had been a sign put up on that gate instructing delivery drivers to call his father, Max, if they were delivering packages for him. That way, they could get through the gate to make the delivery. Then, as she got further onto the property, as she approached the home, immediately, she could tell that the front door was open and that the glass on the door had been shattered. There was glass all over the place. Then, as she got closer, she was met with a horrifying sight. She saw Patrick lying still, unresponsive, right by the front door. He was lying in a pool of blood, and it was clear that someone had attacked him. Shortly after Shannon made this discovery, she was joined by Jessica, who also had decided to go to the house to check on him. And that is when Jessica saw her fiancé lying lifeless on the ground in his home. In that moment, she felt the earth shatter all around her. She felt her future being ripped away from her. Everything she was so excited for, this next chapter in her life that she was looking forward to, was now gone. Right away, Shannon called the police to report that Patrick had been murdered. When officers arrived on scene, they saw Patrick lying in the doorway to his home, dead after suffering from four gunshot wounds to the torso. It was found that his foot was still on the second step in the staircase leading to the front door and his body had fallen back onto the base of the stairs. Based on where his body was, it appeared that Patrick had opened the front door when he was immediately confronted with the gunman. Then, as Patrick started to turn around, he was shot and fell back. This appeared to be an ambush where the shooter came to that home with the purpose of surprising Patrick and murdering him. After this discovery, police started their investigation into who could have been responsible for this sudden murder that seemed so random, so out of nowhere. First, investigators collected several shell casings and projectiles from around Patrick's body. These shell casings were from 300 blackout ammunition from a 30 caliber bullet fired from some sort of rifle. Now, this home was surrounded by security cameras, so if there was anyone on that property, it should have been caught on video. But when detectives made their way into the home, 
they found that Patrick's laptop, as well as the digital storage unit that connected to the security system, were both missing. So whoever shot Patrick knew about the security system and knew where to find the devices which stored that video. As this investigation was starting, of course, detectives started speaking with anyone and everyone from Patrick's circle to see if they had any idea of who could be responsible. They spoke with Shannon, Max, Patricia, and of course, Jessica. And almost immediately when speaking with Jessica, she gave detectives the name of a man who she felt was responsible for her fiance's murder, her ex, Gregory Bender. Turns out, Jessica and Gregory had been in an eight-year-long tumultuous relationship which had ended shortly before Jessica met Patrick. Now, the two originally met in 2009, also on a dating website. At the time, Gregory was 42 years old and almost 20 years older than Jessica. Gregory was a successful, wealthy hedge fund manager who was known to be intelligent and charismatic. According to Jessica, when the two met, much like Patrick, the two hit it off quickly. Jessica felt like she had known him her whole life right when they met, and as their relationship progressed, the two became best friends. But as time went on, Jessica did notice that Gregory had a bit of a habit of becoming jealous and possessive. She explained that she never feared Gregory or felt that he was going to do anything to harm her, but she was always worried that he could hurt other men. If another man expressed interest in her or maybe got too close for his comfort level, he could escalate to verbal threats against these other men. But despite his flaws, she still loved him and wanted to be with him. Eventually, he did propose and she accepted. She was ready to be married to Gregory and spend her life with him. However, a few years after the engagement, Jessica found out that Gregory was not the man she thought he was. In early 2016, Gregory had undergone a surgical procedure and was recovering in the ICU when Jessica decided to pay him a surprise visit. Well, when she got to the room, she was met with another woman. This woman asked Jessica who she was and she said that she was Gregory's fiance and showed the woman her ring. This woman replied that she was Gregory's wife showing Jessica her ring. Yes, that's right. This entire time, Gregory was married to another woman, Daimara Sanchez. Of course, this news devastated Jessica. Her heart just dropped and she couldn't believe what she was hearing. She was in shock. Several days passed before Gregory finally reached out to Jessica to explain the situation. He told her that he was only married to Daimara out of convenience. He supported her financially and allowed her to live in his home so her son could be in their school district. After all, Gregory lived in a $750,000 home in a wealthy suburb of Orlando, so the school was probably a pretty good one. He apologized profusely, saying that it was literally just a business arrangement, nothing to be taken seriously. At that point, Jessica was willing to take Gregory back, but she told Gregory that he needed to divorce Daimara. She said that he had until the end of the year to be fully divorced from her, and if he wasn't, she was leaving. But of course, as you can imagine, this whole story of Daimara just being this business partnership was just that. It was a story. As the months went on, Gregory stayed married to her, and as she promised by early 2017, after realizing that he was not going to follow through with her demands, Jessica left Gregory after eight long years of dating him. It was one month after the breakup when she met Patrick. However, even though Gregory was married to another woman, he could not accept that Jessica broke up with him. He was not willing to let her go. Jessica tried her best to keep him at an arm's distance and basically just cut him off completely. She did not tell him about her new relationship because she was afraid of what he could do to Patrick. Initially, she was able to keep the relationship a secret from him, but after five months of dating, he found Patrick's Facebook and discovered the relationship. From there, Gregory started sending Patrick various messages on Facebook. Some were ominous and threatening, and some were straight up alarming. He would then start calling Jessica and left her voicemails saying that he was making plans and that he was going to carry them out so Patrick better watch his back. 
At one point, he threatened to hire a hitman to kill Patrick. Then at another point, he threatened to do the job himself. During the course of these threatening phone calls and messages, Gregory had asked Jessica to see her on multiple occasions, promising that if she met up with him to talk, that no one would be hurt. So, she did meet up with him in public places, hoping that by talking him through this, she could calm him down. Little did she know, however, that any time they went out together, he had actually hired a private investigator to record them and take pictures, which he then sent to Patrick to show him that they were still meeting up and that there was still something between them. He had also hired a PI to spy on Patrick. Now, the pictures and videos of Gregory and Jessica meeting up did upset Patrick and caused some issues in their relationship. Jessica later said that while she and Gregory met up, he would make it a point to rub her leg and try to hold her hand, things that he had never done before and was now all of a sudden doing. To her, looking back, it seemed like he was putting on a show to make Patrick more suspicious of why they were meeting up. And for a minute, it did work. Patrick and Jessica actually broke up for a few days because of these encounters, but ultimately, they made up. Patrick trusted Jessica and trusted her intentions. He was very well aware of the threats made against the both of them, so he knew why Jessica was meeting up with him at the end of the day. After months of dealing with these threats and constant calls and texts, by early December of 2017, Jessica finally brought the evidence to a judge and asked for an order of protection against Gregory. This order was granted, and he was told to stay away from Jessica and Patrick. He was also ordered to hand over his large, extensive collection of firearms to the authorities. In the months that followed the restraining order, things went quiet. Finally, Jessica and Patrick could go about their relationship in peace without this annoying, obsessive, jealous ex trying to get between them. That was until the morning of February 27th, 2018, when Jessica randomly got a call from Gregory at her work. He called two times, but she didn't answer. However, just seeing his name and her caller ID sent her into a panic. There had to be a reason why he was suddenly calling her after leaving her alone for so many months. That is when Jessica started reaching out to Patrick over and over to make sure he was okay. Of course, we know that she wasn't getting a response, so that is when she decided to head over to his place and check on him. Upon her arrival, she discovered that the love of her life had been shot to death. Within hours after the discovery of Patrick's body and with Jessica telling investigators about Gregory, they asked Jessica if she could call Gregory and see if he would admit to any involvement. She agreed, but on that call, Gregory said that he saw what happened on the news and he was sorry. He said that he had no idea who could have wanted to hurt someone like Patrick. Of course, Jessica reminded him of the threats he made against Patrick, literally saying that he was going to kill him, but he basically just denied ever saying anything like that. He told Jessica that he was her friend and that he would never want to see her hurt like this. She did straight up ask him if he shot Patrick, and once again, he denied having anything to do with it. At the time, police did feel like Gregory could be their suspect. It made perfect sense. Initially though, they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him for the murder. They did, however, have enough to arrest him for violating the terms of the restraining order. Again, he called her twice that morning, which was not allowed. Based on this, police did arrest Gregory and put him in jail while they continued their investigation. As that was happening just hours after Patrick's murder, investigators received a tip that would blow the whole case wide open. At that point, they really needed more evidence to fully connect Gregory to the murder, and with this tip, they got exactly what they needed. Turns out, Demara Sanchez, who I mentioned earlier as Gregory's wife, obtained legal counsel because of something she had found in her home. Through her lawyer, she contacted the authorities to inform them that back in December of 2017, she and Gregory did end up getting a divorce. He wasn't the one who wanted it though, she actually filed for divorce, though it was uncontested by Gregory. And finally, it went through in December. While the two were still married and just prior to the divorce, 
She told officers that she had found a blue spiral notebook, which she believed contained a detailed murder plot written in Gregory's handwriting. It had a whole list of things that he would do to kill someone, including a list of clothing items, what methods would be used, how to get rid of evidence, and things like that. It also included a detailed map that showed a property as well as directions for how to gain access to that property. When she originally found this notebook, she did confront Gregory about it, but he said that it was just a fantasy, something he wrote as a fictional story or something that wasn't real. It was just him getting his thoughts out on the page, I guess. The two actually fought about this, but ultimately, she let it go. For the months that followed, she completely forgot about it until she learned of Patrick's death. Using this information, by the following day, February 28th, police were able to obtain a search warrant to search the home and see if they could find this murder plot. And pretty quickly, they actually found what they were looking for. Inside a wastebasket within the home, detectives found two crumpled up pieces of notebook paper. They backed them into evidence, and once they were able to examine them, they realized that this was, in fact, the exact same murder plot that Daimara had told them about. First, it had a list of what he was going to do, but those original instructions actually did not match what ultimately happened. First, Gregory's plan was to act like he was robbing Patrick. He would gain access into his home and tell Patrick that he only wanted to rob him, not murder him. If he cooperates, he will live. The plan was to then inject Patrick with a mix of heroin and fentanyl and then wait 15 minutes to see if he was still alive. If he was still breathing, he was going to suffocate him with his hands to finish him off. In the plan, he also wrote that he needed a new hoodie and sweatpants. He said that he needed to put some duct tape on the bottom of a second pair of shoes so that he doesn't leave any obvious shoe prints wait until he is alone, turn off cell phones, and then throw away any clothes, license plates, trackers, and gloves. He wrote that it would be useful to have a GPS like a Garmin and not use the one on his phone. He noted that Patrick had a dog named Optimus, but that the dog was old and slow, so he didn't need to worry too much about him. Then, as Daimara told officers, there was a map drawn out which literally had Patrick's address written on it. On that map, there's a detailed drawing of the main road that you take to get to the property. He draws the gate, the mailbox, driveway, the house, and notes on how many cars are parked there. And what investigators saw of that property where Patrick lived, Gregory's drawing was crazy accurate, like spot on. Along with that murder plot that was clearly in Gregory's handwriting and very clearly was Patrick's address, investigators also found more evidence in Gregory's home. Like I stated earlier, detectives found shell casings near Patrick's body at the scene. He had been shot a total of four times. However, investigators only found two casings near his body. During their searches of Gregory's home, though, they found what they believed to be the two missing casings within a junk drawer in Gregory's desk. The two casings found in that drawer matched the casings that they found at the scene. Now, although they never officially found the actual murder weapon, it was pretty clear that Gregory was in possession of spent shell casings that matched the 300 blackout ammo used to kill Patrick. This is a very unique and uncommon type of ammo, so it could be reasonably deduced that it was the same ammo. At this point, police did feel like they had enough to officially arrest and charge then 51-year-old Gregory with Patrick's murder, and he pleaded not guilty. So by May of 2021, the trial started. The prosecution was arguing that Gregory had always been this jealous, possessive, controlling partner to Jessica, despite the fact that he was literally married. When given this ultimatum of Jessica asking him to divorce his wife, he didn't do it, so Jessica left. But he still couldn't accept the breakup. He continuously asked for her back, but she basically just cut him out of her life. But then, once he realized that she was in a new relationship, he just went berserk. He could not stand the thought of her being happy with anybody else. He could not stand the thought of her being happy with anybody else. And he saw Patrick as just being in the way of him getting her back. So he decided to take him out of the equation, hoping that she would just take him back. 
He started by trying to tear the couple apart through making threats. When that didn't work, he convinced Jessica to meet up with him, telling her that he wouldn't hurt Patrick if she complied. When she agreed, he secretly took videos and sent them to Patrick, hoping he would break up with her for meeting up with him behind his back. But when none of that worked, and now Jessica was planning to marry Patrick, he formulated this murder plot. He first came up with a plan to drug him, but that isn't what he ended up doing. He most likely stalked Patrick and Jessica for a while and somehow figured out the exact layout of his property. Then he probably realized that getting into his home and drugging him by like laying his hands on him was probably not going to work because Patrick could probably fight him off because, you know, Gregory was much older than Patrick. So he decided to just take the easy way. So by the morning of February 27th, 2018, Gregory arrived to the property using an access road to get near the home. He saw the sign which said to call Patrick's dad to deliver a package, so he called Max and set up a fake package delivery, granting him access to the property. He then hid in the bushes and waited for Patrick to come to the door. Once he was at the door and fully exposed, Gregory stood directly in front of him about 10 feet away and opened fire into the home, shooting Patrick four times through the glass door. He then walked into the house and grabbed Patrick's computer and the hard drive to get rid of the surveillance video of him being on that property. It was a carefully planned and executed assassination of her ex's new lover, all because he was jealous that he couldn't have her back. The prosecution discussed the threats Gregory had been making in the months before the murder, the order of protection taken out against him, how he literally called Jessica the morning of the murder after having no contact with her for months. They talked about the murder plot he wrote out, which literally had Patrick's address written on it. Even though it didn't match up what he ended up doing, it was still clearly a planned plot with his address and a drawing of his house on it. Then there were shell casings found in his home, which matched the shell casings found at the scene. This was an open and shut case. They had multiple witnesses testify, including Jessica, who spoke about how toxic and manipulative Gregory is and always was throughout their relationship. He was always trying to control her, and when she finally left, it was no different. He made those threats, and eventually, he followed through with them. Daimara also testified, saying that she knew this murder plot was for Patrick and it terrified her when she heard the news of Patrick's death. She knew that her ex-husband was responsible. The defense, on the other hand, claimed that Gregory was not the one responsible for the murder. They said that this whole case is purely circumstantial. There's nothing to it. No DNA evidence, no fingerprints, no physical evidence that shows that he was ever even at that property. They said that the murder plot he drew out was just a fantasy, not something he ever planned to follow through with. After all, the plot didn't even match the actual crime. Patrick wasn't overdosed like it was laid out in the plot. He was shot. Then, when it came to the shell casings, it was just a coincidence because Gregory is an avid collector of firearms. He basically had an arsenal. So yes, he may have had shell casings that happened to match the ones at the scene, but that's because he just enjoyed guns and had many of them. They also brought up that maybe Jessica and Gregory weren't on such bad terms after all. They pointed to that secret video Gregory took of them when they met up, which shows them holding hands and, like I said, shows Gregory rubbing her leg. They argued that maybe Jessica was secretly back with Gregory. Therefore, Gregory would have no reason to kill Patrick. The defense actually tried pointing the finger at Patrick's dad, Max. They said that Max was always known to make comments about Jessica's physical appearance. He was very outspoken about how beautiful he thought she was. Therefore, the defense argued that Max was possibly making passes at Jessica and he wanted to be with her. Maybe she rejected him or he just knew that he couldn't have her with Patrick in the picture, so he murdered his own son to be with Jessica. That is what the defense tried arguing. But of course, Max completely denied any of it, saying that yes, Jessica is beautiful, but so was his son. They were a beautiful couple, and saying that does not mean that he is attracted to her at all. Besides, 
we know that he was 70 miles away in a work trip. So although it's technically possible that he could have been there at the time of the murder, it's very unlikely. After four days of testimony, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury was off for deliberations. And after deliberating, they came back with their verdict. They found that Gregory Bender is in fact guilty of the first degree premeditated murder of Patrick de la Cerda. At the sentencing hearing, the courts heard from family members of Patrick, all who are absolutely devastated at this loss. He was such a bright, compassionate young man who didn't deserve any of this. He was looking forward to spending his life with Jessica, the woman he loved, but instead, that was ripped away from him and her because some jealous, obsessive, middle-aged man couldn't control his emotions and decided that instead of just moving on, he was going to ruin countless lives. In the end, Gregory was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He did try to appeal his conviction since then, but as of today, he remains behind bars for this unthinkable act. In the aftermath of this, Jessica is obviously heartbroken and devastated, not only because of the loss of Patrick, but for the loss of the future she was so excited for. On her 30th birthday, Patrick's family actually surprised her with that ring that Patrick ordered custom for her. She was so happy to finally see and wear this ring that Patrick put so much thought and effort into, and the last I saw, she still wears that ring to this day because Patrick is and forever will be her true love. That part of this case just truly breaks my heart. But that is all of the information we have on today's case. I completely agree with what the jury decided in this case. I absolutely think Gregory killed Patrick in some twisted way of trying to get him out of the picture, hoping he could have Jessica back. Either that, or he just wanted Jessica to suffer as much as possible. Either way, I think he is a selfish, narcissistic monster who is right where he belongs, and I hope he never sees the light of day again. But... With that, now I want to hear your thoughts on this case. Do you agree with the verdict? Why do you think this happened to begin with? And do you think there was enough evidence to convict him even though it was all circumstantial? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!